Hi and welcome to another episode of the Leadership Enigma. Look, every single week I think is a gift where I get to talk to people and unpeel a little bit of who they are and what they're doing and why they're doing things. So it's an enormous pleasure for me in this episode to have Errol Gardner, who's the Global Vice Chair Consulting of Ernst & Young. Now, let me just give you some numbers to put this in perspective. Uh, EY have about 400,000 people working for them and consulting itself has 100,000 people working for them. I'm already looking at Errol in relation to how is that possible? How does one lead an organization of that size? Because he's on the executive team of EY EY, and he's also heading up the 100,000 that make up consulting. In some ways, he and I share a similar swimming pool in relation to consulting. But as you know, I'm deeply curious in relation to the human being as well as the human doing. Trust me, you do not want to miss this particular episode. Come back to me just after this break. Hi, I'm Adam Pacifico, and welcome to The Leadership Enigma, a world-ranked, award-winning podcast that's insatiably curious as regards what leaders do, how they do it, and importantly, why. We'll delve into the human doing, but even deeper into the human being and the power of human-centered leadership to drive sustainable change. So whether you're an entrepreneur, business owner, corporate executive, each week we speak to global experts, academics, rising stars, ambitious upstarts and disruptors, as together we will discover that success leaves clues. So it's a massive warm welcome, Errol. Thank you so much for coming into the studio. How are you? I'm really good. Great to be here. Love the uh, love this place. Love how you've done the, done up this place. It's fantastic. <laughs> well, I think James has got to take all credit. Do you know what? The studio has been a focus of much conversation <laughs> by guests. <laughs> have you been into a studio like this before? I've, I have. Uh, I mean, we use similar facilities ourselves uh, within EY, but also independent places. But it always amazes me in what appears such a small space, what you can get in here. It's pretty cool, and, isn't uh, it? Yeah, it is. I feel it like is. it's my second home, and I just want to say a massive thank you. I've been looking forward to every episode I look forward to. Yeah. So firstly, thank you very much for taking the time to come into North London on what is an extremely cold day in <laughs> London as well. So in some ways, we're we're wrapped up warm. But listen, I, I gave a very brief introduction, so I, I want to start with that because the scale of the role that you've got and the scale of the organisation is something that I, I want people to understand. So just tell us a little bit about your, your current role. Well, as you mentioned, so I'm uh, the, the, the wonderful title of Global Vice Chair of I, Consulting. It is a good and, title. And, which probably doesn't mean a great deal to many people, <laughs> but essentially means I lead our consulting practice around the world. Uh, and as you mentioned, it's over 100,000 people that yeah. make that up. Um, and, and it's interesting you talked about the 400,000 people of EY, and yeah. I think just to give you another stat, which yeah. will, will keep you... Uh, maybe also blow your mind a little bit. We, I think in 2022, we had 2 million applications uh, to our organization. 2 million? 2 million. So we, I think we ended up hiring about 150,000 people around the world. But think about all the efforts, and I think you know that very well, all the effort that would go into yeah. filtering that volume of people. But of course, I mean, in terms of running that part of the business, my, my job to a certain extent, is defining the strategy for the organization, the consulting part of the organization, yes. making sure that we're clear about our market and value proposition to our clients. But also importantly, as you've mentioned, with 100,000 people, it's a lot about the people that we employ. Yes, They are the asset that drives what we do in the marketplace, that serve our clients, that, that enhance our brand. So looking after those people, making sure we're hiring, developing, motivating uh, the best people in the marketplace is a critical part of what I have to do. Let me ask you a question. How, how does it feel as a leader of such an enormous amount of people on a personal level? Do you ever suddenly think, hang on, I've got 100,000 people to lead here? Because I tell you why, I had a, a CEO sat in, in your very seat who, who went from a dozen people and then and then there was a huge investment into the business and now there's 400. And he's taken that very personally in relation to how do I serve and look after those people. Is the number almost too big, Errol? 100,000 out of, and 400,000? <laughs> that it's almost, where, where does one start? Well, I think like any organization, you are, and it's interesting you talked about somebody having a small number who goes up to a bigger number. Yeah. 
what you do as you get bigger and bigger is put structures in place that in essence then you're you're of course not leading every one of those 100,000 people yeah you're in many ways a leader of leaders so there's we have a very decentralized structure of accountability and responsibility in different countries by different skills and capability sets and we have we're a partnership structure as a business so partners would lead different aspects of that business so in many ways, my, my job is to motivate the next set of leaders who then motivate the leaders that roll up and report to them, who then, you the know, cascade. and it cascades down in that way. But, but to your, I mean, to your point, though, it is something that you do uh, occasionally, and thank you for reminding me of it and to think about it that way again. You do think, you know, it, one, it's awesome to have something of that scale and magnitude and the impact that you can have with it. But it is a huge responsibility as well. And obviously we, you know, we're trying to professionally develop a lot of people. But as you know, um, we were talking earlier about the pandemic and things. People are not just going through a lot in their professional lives. They're going through a lot in their personal lives as well. And so in our business, that's also really important to keep that connection and make sure we're looking after those people as part of what we do as an organization. So you absolutely do feel a real sense of responsibility of making sure that uh, yeah. every day we're all showing up to make sure that we're doing the best for that for those individuals because it was a again it just reminds me of this conversation he said when he went up to 220 people he said there are about 220 working days in the year he said he he almost had the feeling that on any given day there was probably someone within his organization having a personal crisis yeah. of some form of description and it made it very real to him so i just wondered as, as you say when you've got numbers which are vast and you've got to rely on your leadership your role modeling to cascade through the organization does it become easier or harder to to see the individuals or to that personal touch because you say a hundred thousand people impossible to get around a hundred thousand people yeah i mean well what i uh what i do personally and i mentioned about being you know the partnership structure and yep. being a leader of leaders but what i'll always do so i do a lot of traveling as, as part of the nature of my role yeah uh so i'm probably on the road for 60 65 percent of the year so obviously based here in london but i travel internationally yes and in doing so i will always meet both partners but also staff and oftentimes even new staff, graduates, interns coming into the business, just to understand and get that perspective. So you, of course, can never touch and listen to 100,000 people individually. Yes. But if if and when you do visit those different locations, so, you know, an experience in Japan versus Australia or India versus the west coast of the US or Scotland even versus what you might see in Germany, when you, you get a very... You get a sense of what unites us as an organization and yeah. seemingly similar issues that those individuals have and some similar opportunities. But then you also hear a little bit of, you know, that the water cooler <laughs> yeah. items and topics What's that the, people are, the cold are talking face, about. Right? Absolutely. And that's having that level of intelligence, if I can put it that way. I mean, in terms of yeah. what on the ground people are concerned about, talking about is really important. Well, so what is your you're thinking in relation to because you're a role model to so many people and I have this conversation and I'm not just I'm not fla <laughs> flattering for the sake of it because there are lots of I really believe this there are going to be lots and lots of people within the organization and externally who you don't know but they yes. see you and they hear you and they say that's my leader or that's the leader of consulting or that's one of the leaders of the business what are your thoughts in relation to your role as a role model to people who you you don't know their names, but they know you. Well, it's it's one of my. I mean, again, it's 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 something else that I contemplate quite extensively, and and just to bring it to life a little yeah. bit, because uh, you introduced me, you gave me my role. Oftentimes, I will show up to meetings and say, "I'm Errol Gardner. This is what I." We know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> so this happens. <laughs> oh yeah, all the time. <laughs> And or I'll jump into the lift in in an office, and people say, "Oh, oh hello, Errol. I'm yeah. X Y Z." Um, and of course, that naturally for me just creates a moment of, "Do we know each other, 
or you just know who I am. Yeah, they know you. And I, and I get into a real panic sometimes that it's I some people's faces you recognise yeah. and you think yeah, but I don't remember your name and I. So it it is something I'm very aware of, and I'm even aware of it to the extent that outside of work, a lot of people you kind of. You, you spot people maybe shopping or yeah. doing whatever who obviously recognize you as well. And you're thinking, why do you recognize me? Why do you see me? What, There's a little bit of notoriety, I think, going yeah. on here. So, it, with... so there is an element of that that you, you just have to accept goes with the territory and uh, you will be known more than you realize. I think on the role model part of it, uh, I think that is that is the case. You yeah. see, I mean, I've I've lived my life as very much with no regrets. And I, if I kind of always look back in any kind of way, I struggle to quantify or really understand how I've got to where I've got to. But at the same time, what, it, what, is, what I find really difficult then is how do I be a role model? How do I, how do, I do that and show that more outwardly to help people? Yeah. if you like. So, and I'm very aware of that, obviously, in terms of my color and my profile, some of the things that I've done, my history, uh, that that could be more of an inspiration for, to people. And I haven't, I probably have only recognized that in the last three or four years of my career. Before that, it wasn't really something I focused on at all. So what changed? I don't know, really. I think, um, in a way, it may well have been the pandemic. And I, th right. I think you'll remember... Um, one particular event that happened um, in in May 2020 when we had the George Floyd um, murder in in the US and yes. the in our organization and I think in many others you know we were all in lockdown at the time but the the impact and the ripple effect that that had across especially in our US business but you saw it in a number of Western markets we here did. in the UK in Australia in France in different um, geographies, that people were, A, obviously very angry about what happened there, but also became much more vocal about what was happening within their own organisation. It was a catalyst, wasn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. And so, you know, with with myself in a leadership role, and I actually, ca I actually came into this role a month before that happened. Oh, wow. So it became something that was very obviously an open door if you like and and um that i had to then raise my voice and be an advocate for those that were you know struggling because of the experiences they were having in the workplace both within our organization within other, within other organizations in clients wherever that may be and some of the barriers that they were facing but also some of the reactions they were getting as a consequence of the environment that was happening at that time. Yeah. And then it wasn't, you know, that spiraled then because of COVID. You had a lot of anti-Asian uh, activity that started to happen and, and, and all kinds of things that became very much a, a, a movement. And, and at the time, we set up as an organization what, was what we called a global social equity task force, right. which was looking at these types of issues and say, well, how do we... How do we start to address this issue of equitable outcomes for people that join our organization, wherever they exist in our world? And because my role's global, it's it's very different in different locations. So you, you could be speaking to, you know, someone in the U.S. whose experience of growing up yep. in that society is very different to even somebody here in the U.K., but, uh, you know, again, classically, and you see some of the troubles that we've got currently in the Middle East and, and how they have to balance different people's perspectives based on their religion, based on their racial origin and all of these topics. And you think, actually, that is what's happening. You talk in India to the caste system and people that, that have challenges as a consequence of that. You look, you look to Japan in terms of how they view immigration and think about that and what that means in that society. Canada, they've got um, a big drive in terms of their um, the the population that were that were um, uh, I guess the original inhabitants of that land space. Similar in Australia, so all, across the spectrum, masses of different issues, but all centered on the same one: 
that actually we are not, you mentioned the word human being earlier, yeah. we are not equal as human beings in the workplace. I remember during the pandemic, I was doing an event virtual for India and I had some doctors on the line and, and I never forget one of the, the, the doctors turned around to me and she said, listen, we're all suffering the same storm. But she said, you have to understand we're in very different boats. Yeah. And I really reflected on that. Um, I haven't even got to the part I was going to start with, Errol, because this is fascinating. So let me let me just, in some ways I'm summarizing because there is a question with this. You've got yeah. over 400,000 people around the world who very proudly work for a globally iconic organization which sustains them. Therefore, they all have slightly different lived experiences because of what is going on in the world. And let's be, and let's be honest, the world is incredibly changeable. Mm. What's the role of an organization of your size, though, when it comes to being a force for good beyond products and services what an organization stands for how an organization is trusted what good an organization can do what are your thoughts on that because you're right at the top of that pyramid and you how many countries are ey now based in 154 a hundred and that is that's enormous so yeah. the, the reach of an organization such as ey goes far beyond almost a singular government or regime yeah, so and we're very aware of that responsibility. So uh, one of our previous chairs, uh, uh, I think quite boldly at the time, said a, that we should have a purpose as an organization, which yep. is building a better working world. So this is 12 years ago where okay. um, I don't think that was the vogue at the time. And I think since then it's become much more the vogue. But the notion of the building a better working world was saying, look, we, we employ a lot of people. We also have a lot of people come through our organization through, because it's not like we employ 400,000 people and they stay with us forever. So You're a gateway. A lot, yeah, exactly. We actually train a lot of people, be it accountants that go on to be CFOs and CEOs and various other things, or it can be consultants that go on and work in industry and, yeah. and make different make a difference there a number of different skills and professions. So we have an obligation in many ways to um, think about what role we can play as an organization. Now, when that landed 12 uh, years or so ago, you had a lot of people in our organization very cynical. I mean, what is this building about? What I mean, what are we going to do? What? But actually, it became one of the most important elements for recruitment. So if you, you went to campus, you went to any graduate, yep. they actually were really interested, okay, so what are you doing to build a better working that world? That purpose. Yes. How are you, what what are you make? what difference are you making? So, I mean, very briefly, what I'd say, what that's about for us is, obviously, we've got a fundamental role in terms of the capital yep. markets. You, you invest in companies, shares, organizations. We're the auditors of a number of those organizations and businesses. Yes. If you can't be, if... Those organizations can't be trusted and the investments that you make, that's a role we play in an ecosystem to give a level of comfort and confidence uh, that those things, those investments are secure. People rely on those for their pensions. Yeah. They rely on their to, to buy houses and their savings, et cetera, et cetera. Similarly, if you think about a, a more current issue like sustainability, for instance, we know COP28 is yeah. uh, happening as we speak Coming here. Up. So, you know, for... for yeah, what role can we play in being an advocate and a driver of change around sustainability in the world? How can we help organizations to make the change towards net zero, to make some of, some of the changes that they have to put in terms of their operations, the products and services that they deliver, but also the business practices that they undertake? We just talked about equity um, and social justice, some yes. of these things, making sure that they're at the forefront of how they operate. So that's, that is the kind of thing that we are bringing to life in an action through our purpose, both, both in terms of the paid work we do, but also a lot of unpaid work we do. So we've got a, a program called EY Ripples, where we allow all of our employees two days of work that they can do uh, community work within their um, uh, environment. And we kind of gather all of that up. And it's when you look at the yeah. impact of what we do, across the world with charitable organizations impacting in different countries. We have people flying to uh, different parts of the world in terms of making interventions on the ground there. It's absolutely an amazing story. I love the fact you've just used the word ripple because I was about to say before that, it, it, there's this significant ripple impact 
for the business. It's not like a stone, it's a brick in the pond with the, yes. with the ripple impact. Does that sometimes feel overwhelming when you're at the top of the house? Do you think to yourself, wow, we do a lot and there's so much more we everyone can always do? Does it sometimes well, it, think, wow? I, I wouldn't say, it, I mean, wow is the right word. Overwhelming not. I think we all just feel very proud that actually... A, we know we have the responsibility, but when you actually at the end of every year then look at some of our numbers and reflect on some of the things that, and it's not what we as leaders have achieved, it's what our people and the organization has achieved. Collectively, you can feel very, very proud of some of the outcomes that we're driving. I want to go backwards to go forwards because, um, yeah, we went on. We went in that direction because <laughs> that felt right, didn't it, in relation to yeah. the conversation we were having. How did you end up in consulting? Let me just ask that question first, then we're going to go even further backwards. Uh, well, I started by serendipity to a certain extent. I started my career uh, back in 1990, and I went from university into um, another professional services firm into audit. Right. And, and so I did, uh, and in a way it was a little bit, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say this was a passion of mine at the time. It was almost a production line thing that had started with my parents, and we can maybe get onto that later. We but, <laughs> but um, so I did that, and, I, and you know, I became professionally qualified. And and what I then um, did was say, okay, I, I'm not sure I'm feeling this, uh, but the an opportunity came up for me to go to Jamaica, and my parents are Jamaican. That's their heritage, so it was a real. Um, moment for me and I said okay let's let's embrace that do that so I moved uh, to do audit in Jamaica while I was there yeah probably about five or six months in one of my clients there said oh you know we're going to put in a new system Oracle Financials you don't need it doesn't matter what that is you don't need to care about that you know a little bit about um, how our financial records product could you yep. help the team figure some things out and do that I said, well, yeah, I could, but that's that's not what we auditors do. That's what the consultants do. And then there was a guy who I'd maybe characterize as my first mentor in, in terms of my career, uh, coached me about moving from audit to consult. I said, oh, don't worry about it. You can still do audit, but just do this for the first, yeah. uh, for these f next four or five months, and then you can flip back to doing audit work. I've not done any audits since that moment. Never went back? No. So it was a sliding door moment that I, I could have chosen not to do it, and who knows uh, what I'd have ended up doing. But I, in essence, I, I lent into that. It moved on to actually doing more work with the same client, uh, but from a consulting perspective, and then uh, that's what I've done for the last 30 years. I want to ask you some more questions in relation to what it felt like to be in Jamaica, because I know it had a big impact on you. Yeah. But again, I, I want to go slightly earlier because you were born and bred in Yorkshire. Yes. So tell us a little bit about that. As you can tell from my accent. No doubt. <laughs> so no, I was, I was born in, yeah, I was born in, in Leeds um, and spent all Leeds my formative... Leeds is a great city, come on, right? No, it's a fantastic city and spent all my formative years there. So until I went to university... Yep. Um, and so, as I mentioned, my my mother and father were were both Jamaican, so yeah. they they came across here. Um, my mother in the fifties, and my father um, in the forties. He was actually, um, you. I think you. Everybody knows about the Windrush generation here yes. in the UK, but yes. uh, so he was actually on the Empire Windrush. He was He was on the right. original ship in nineteen forty eight. He was actually here two years before that as well. A lot of people don't realize that quite a few folks came here during and post the Second World War. Right. So he was part, he was in the RAF initially, um, went back to Jamaica and then came back on the Windrush. And it was just as a sidebar, um, his brother is still alive. The two of them came together on the Windrush. So if you, on the Pride of Britain Awards this year, a few weeks ago, um, uh, my dad's brother, and so my uncle was visited by one of, um, or by the um, Prince of Wales wow. at his home to celebrate <laughs> him. He's 97 years old oh, today, wow. uh, 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 this year. As I think he's one of two surviving members of the the that that initial 1948 HMS Windrush uh, 
set of folks that came across from the Caribbean and from Jamaica as it was at that time. Yeah. Uh, so long story short, they came in 40s, 50s for my mother. Yes. Uh, they got married. They actually they actually lived in Manchester, and I'll come back to that in a second, and then moved to Leeds. Across the Pennines. Uh, and, uh, yeah, of course, the War of the Roses. For those that will know up there, the, the, the two are absolutely adore each other. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, they in many ways came from – you know, backgrounds. My dad worked in a factory and my mother was a midwife. But but I guess, and it was absolutely my mother, was very relentless both with my brother and I that we did our best in, from an education perspective. And she was... So she that was, was ingrained in you? Yeah, she had okay. us on it. She, she said, you know, the reason I'm here is to make sure that your life is better than my life is. Okay. So you know, education is your pathway to doing that. And so... Um, no matter what we did and no matter what mis- misdemeanors we got up to, our results, our grades, all of those things had to be on it. So, And where did that come from in her? Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, one of the uh, difficulties, obviously, of having parents who had come from Jamaica is I didn't know my grandparents. Right. So we didn't travel back when they were still alive. So, I mean, I've heard a lot about them since, but I, I think... I think a lot of that generation that came across yes. were always being were partly under the promise of a better life uh, in terms of being here, but also I think they recognized it was an opportunity to to do. And even if it didn't manifest itself for them, because I think for a lot of them it didn't, yeah. um, and that, you know, they were trailblazers to make it easier, uh, by no means easy, but easier for yeah. people like myself. Um, and I think they saw, as I, as I mentioned, that, you know, the route to that wasn't, it wasn't going to fall into your lap. It was, my mother was all about education and, and my father was always about his famous phrase, you need to work twice as hard as anybody else that looks maybe a little bit like you in this country, sure. as opposed to a little bit more like me in order to be successful. So those were the two mantras that whatever you do, make sure your grades are good. But in the working environment, be ready to work twice as hard as your compatriots to make sure that you can uh, uh, succeed in life. Tell me a little bit about what it felt like kind of living, growing up in Yorkshire at that time. Well, it was um, <laughs> it was very different. And, you know, I think probably the one of the ways of describing uh you know, life at that time was, I talked about Manchester and Leeds earlier. I'm actually a bizarrely a Manchester United fan. And when I say that to people, they're like, hold on, we'll from Leeds. We'll have could, to come back to that era. How could that, how could that be? And, and one of the reasons for that is in the 70s, Leeds United were very associated with, they had a white kit. Right. They were very associated with whiteness, right. if you like. And and, and Yorkshire, to a certain extent, it, bizarrely, you saw it in the cricket in Yorkshire at the time. And then, you yeah. know, I think we've now seen 40 years later that they've had issues with that as well. Yes. So it was very difficult as a black child growing up where you experienced racism all the time. And difficult in one sense, because obviously you're a child, you can't quite understand yeah. why you're being subjected to that. But in a way, it was also a great foundation in creating a level of resilience that means that you, not that you're immune to it, but you 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 have mechanisms to deal with that. As I'd say, nothing compared to what my parents had to go through. Right. But just enable you to do that. So, you know, hearing people calling you names, being excluded from things, um, it, it's, it's, it was really, it was tough and challenging from that perspective. And, and we didn't grow up in a neighborhood that had lots of black people either. So in that sense, it probably made it even harder finding uh, similar people that you could relate to or, or that were going through similar experiences. And do you think some of those experiences have helped shape you as a leader now in relation to that awareness, the social equity awareness, in relation to the resilience do you think that's been part and parcel of, of what you have become? And, and let's be honest, we're all work in progress. Yeah. Or who you are as a leader and who you're becoming as a leader. Do you think there's elements of that in there? Uh, yeah, without, without doubt and no question, I, 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 I can relate. 
I think, quite genuinely to any story from any individual based on their background where they've struggled. Right. Uh, where they've had difficulties, where they've had barriers. It doesn't, they don't have to tell the same story I'm telling. But you can, I, I spoke, for instance, a couple of days ago, earlier this week, to one of our folks who's a very young, fantastic individual um, in our technology practice yep. who's got neurodiversity characteristics. And just talking to her about how she's approaching that and what it means in terms of the work environment and how, and and I'm drawn into her story and making that work. And that, that I think, without doubt, my background just helps in many ways project the, the consequences of my experience, if you like, as to how it affected me then as to how their experiences, which are different, but ultimately lead to very similar outcomes and feelings in how they uh, see the world of work and how they interpret in their lives generally, how they're interacting with people in life generally. Do you find yourself also maybe proactively looking at having a very eclectic mix of people on teams and within consulting itself to, to have the, the richness of diversity of thought. Do you find yourself almost um, a bit of a radar in relation to always looking to how do we create uh, an immense yes. pool of diversity of thought? Yeah, I think, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think I do that naturally without um, even really thinking part about and part it. Of who you are. Yeah, it's. I, I think that's really important, and it, in many ways, in consulting, that's critical anyway. That you have a good mix, a good balance, but but absolutely making sure you push that so you don't all have right brain people or all left brain people or you know all gender or particular. Yeah, exactly. You you've got to that creativity, that that ability to make change happen comes from having a mix of people who are. Yeah. who are working effectively together as a team. Let me. I know I'm, I'm shuttling a little bit here. I want to come back to Jamaica, because I remember when we first spoke, you said Jamaica had a big impact on you. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about what you meant by that, 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 that experience in some... Well, you tell me. Well, I think as a, we just went a little bit into my childhood and, the, and touching on that, and I mentioned earlier about I started my career in, in, in London in yep. audit. And if I go back to the early 90s... Um, I think I was maybe there were three interns in three black interns into the intake of I don't know maybe five six hundred people at wow, the time, right. and so you felt very lonely. You, you and and there was, and I was also if you think about my background, I went to a comprehensive school. There were a lot of people who were private school educated. Um, there were the social environment that a lot of people had come from was very different to mine. So I really struggled outside of is audit right for me or not. Right. right. I, I really struggled with is this environment of professional services right for me or not? This kind of working in the city, yes. doing a big suit, you know, pinstripe, all these things looking. Uh, you remember those days. Corporate life. Um, and what, what going to Jamaica ha meant was actually a, a flip for me because if I think about how I was – just as I was leaving, I lacked confidence. I wasn't sure about what I was doing. I was I was very concerned about how I was coming across when I met clients and others and yes. led teams. And then when I went to Jamaica and, and the, the dynamic completely flips because then you walk into a board meeting or you walk in with a senior leader and yes. they're all black. Yeah. They're all, all almost 95% you know, of them. How did that feel? Was that, was, were a sense of relief or was it just, was it an odd experience? It's, it's odd because you're so used to, uh, you walk somewhere and you, you, get, you get this feeling in your belly in terms of what's somebody going to feel like when I walk in the room and they realize I'm black right that's just a thing it's always it's in your head all the time because they'll have heard me on the phone they may have interpreted from my name but ultimately I walk in the room and it'll be like and it's always subtle or actually sometimes not so subtle <laughs> right but it's very obvious and then in in certain circumstances they'll they'll make it so as well but then you go into an environment that the only thing that, that shook people is, oh, you speak with an English accent. What's that all about? And, There's always and, a differentiator, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, but, but actually the not having to deal with that, and in, in many ways, if you think about it before I even walked in the room, those feelings of, of what that's doing to me, 
and and, it, and in my head it said, look, you've you've no longer got any excuses now, right? Because that's the thing I think a lot, and I say this to a lot of folks much earlier in their career. You can always make racism and discrimination and microaggressions and all kinds of things that you suffer an excuse for why you can't show up and deliver. Right. And so for me, it was the moment that I used to say, you can no longer use this as an excuse now. So how are you going to make sure you're the best every day? How are you going to make sure now that actually it's not those things? If if you can't deliver, it's you know something else. Yes. So make sure... So that was the difference for me because ultimately then I was successful there. Um, it was a great platform for me. And what it meant when I returned, so I came back to the UK after about two years there, yep. is I walked into meetings, in, uh, situations there, feeling the same way I did as when I was in Jamaica. I didn't think anymore. You're riding about, the, the same way. Yeah, I didn't think okay. anymore what people thought about me because my confidence was in a different place. Wow. And so I didn't worry about... Can I add value? Do I have a point of view that they should be interested in? Can I make a difference? Because I know I can. Whether they listen to me or not, whether they think, oh, you're a black guy, I don't care. I can't control that. But what I can control is I can make a difference for them. And so I, that that is probably, I'd say, the single most important impact in my professional life of any event uh, or you know moment in time or experience that I've been through. I love that story. And I'm interested now in the role that you have and how you say you're seen, you're heard, you are a role model, you are a leader of many, whether you like it or not, right? Um, what do you think really is your personal mandate now as a leader? What, what is driving you, do you think, each day on a human level, not on a business level? Well, I think... You know, fundamentally, if I if I reflect back on my life, and you you touched earlier on some, is it awesome? Is it overwhelming? Is it a wow moment? Yeah. I think what I've achieved, however I view that, I I feel an obligation to help other people to achieve whatever they can. So if, if I see more and more, I guess, partly as I get older, that ultimately call it legacy, call it that thing, back yep. to purpose. What What is it that motivates you? Uh, it's great that I work in a people business, that ultimately um, the gift I can give to people is helping them to be more successful than they maybe have imagined for themselves. Or um, And so therefore giving them the opportunities to take risks, to put themselves into situations that are going to challenge them, that are going to help them grow and develop, or to give them opportunities in, in particular roles in the organization that mean that they step up the ladder a little bit. That's that's probably the single biggest intervention I can now make that is is going to fulfill that purpose, my personal purpose, in terms of okay. uh, what I can do for people uh, that I work with. So let me ask you a question in relation to leading an organization which is 400,000, being part of the leadership yeah. for 400,000, I think you said in 150 plus countries yeah. around the world. What are some of the things that are at the forefront of your mind as a leader of that size of organization with that size of global footprint? Um, yeah, I, I was going to suggest some things, but I don't want to. Kind of, what, what is at the forefront of your mind in relation to challenge, opportunity, concern, whatever it might be as a leader of that organization? Well, I, I mean, as you can imagine, there's there's quite a list, and we have people that maintain quite long lists. <laughs> That's why I, I want to hesitate. From. Yeah. So if I if I focus maybe on a two or three, yeah, um, very obvious one. So uh, yeah, firstly is the environment in which we 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 operate. We're in 154 countries, et cetera, et cetera. So we we are impacted by geopolitical movements, macroeconomic changes yep. that are impacting the world. So. We, we obviously have to keep a very close pulse and understanding of where is the world, world going, where are some of the dynamics. In I mean, we, you know, for instance, when, when uh, the U Ukraine war happened, that had a massive impact, obviously, on our people that were yeah, based in the Ukraine. It also had a massive impact on our people that were based in Russia at the time and how we had to address that. It also had a massive impact on the diaspora of Ukrainians and Russians in the rest of our business who 
oftentimes people didn't realize they had a connection with that. And loved so, ones still in country. Yeah, exactly. And all sorts. So, and having to, you know, and, and in many ways, where our organization is at its best then, because the beauty of having and being based in 154 countries is you have influence in those countries to make things happen yes. for our people. So that, but the whole geopolitical landscape, obviously, there's a lot of that happening yeah. right now. You know, you know, where are we going with the U.S. and China? What's going to happen in terms of you know the Middle East situation and potential impact? The macroeconomic environment's obviously critically important. In ter- obviously, now it's inflation yes. and and interest rates and where they are and how that impacts our clients' businesses, of course, and then how that rolls and impacts our business as well. And of course, when because we have so many people in our organization, our business model is keeping them busy on client work. Right. And if therefore our client work in any way misses a beat to, or because our clients are suffering because of economic conditions, that means we do. Well, it's a domino effect, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and the consequence of that means that we may have to uh, release some people, make some people redundant. And there's a real human element to exactly, that. Exactly, exactly. So we have to be really, really... Un- understand, if you like, because if you, if you think about it in normal times, we are hiring a lot of people, right? Ordinarily, on yeah. an er- every week, every month, uh, we have graduate intakes coming through as they as they qualify from university. I'm assuming they're hundreds that, that come on mass. Yeah, right. absolutely. So, so what you've got to be very mindful. It's a little bit like filling up the bath while with a plug hole type situation. Is <laughs> right. is as you see the macroeconomic environment changing. Are you sure you're not overfilling up the bath with right. new graduates, new intakes, that actually you may have an issue then uh, down the line that you yeah. can't sustain higher or um, employing that number of people? So keeping that balance both globally but also uh, locally um, is really important as well. How, how do you sense make the, the external environment? Because it's, bon- it's chaotic. So how, how, as a leader, do you make some form of sense and turn that into some form of vision or, or coherent message for people to understand? How- well, you, you, you train on experts. I mean, obviously, there are people that understand uh, all of these things. We, we have we hope. to. Well, no, <laughs> well, no, and that's fair. I mean, people make mistakes or people misread things, of course. But I, I think you have to have a sense of and use data, use insight, use information that you can get from the external market and, into, and internally as well mm. to form a view and form a judgment. But I think given where we are, you also need to be ready to then course correct and be agile. Yeah. I mean, if you take the pandemic as a, for instance, I mean, you can imagine how big an issue that was for us. So we are, if you think about January 2020, we're a business with, I don't know, let's say 300,000 people at the time. Yeah. Probably about 150,000 of them, their normal business practice was going from their home, not to our offices, but to our clients' offices and place of work four or five days a week. Stopped overnight. Stopped overnight. And think about our business practice at the time. Clients wouldn't pay us unless they saw the individual that they were paying for sitting in their offices doing the work. Right. So you've gone from that model to... They're no longer in my office. They're no longer in any office. And I can't physically verify anything. And I don't know what work they're going to do. And we had to completely change our business model to make that work. And, you know, I mean, clients had the same issues. And so everybody leaned in and made it work at the time. But you can imagine that that wasn't on our list in December 2020 or whenever, or 2019, sorry. That was on nobody's list of... Here's one thing that we're going to have to deal with now. But it's really interesting. In in the November of 2019, back to what is things we anticipate versus don't, we were introducing Teams as an application into our uh, – and our chief, chief executives was a, was a bell ringer for this. Oh, we must yeah. do it. Everybody must adopt it. All you leaders, you must show the way. Everybody's like, yeah, who needs this? I mean, what, what are we going to use this Visionary. for? Visionary. <laughs> So I think by February we had, I don't know, maybe 500 people using it, maybe 1,000. Yes. Within six six or seven weeks, we had 230,000 people using our Teams platform. Wow. We'd gone from, I mean, we talk about exponential growth, all those things. It's amazing what we can do when we have to. Exactly. So 
I think we keep a a radar of a whole bunch of external issues, a bunch of obviously internal ones that we need to contemplate and think about. We've got a a rhythm, a cadence yeah. of how we look at our financial performance and all these types of things. Uh, but of course, you know, sometimes uh, things go wrong and what you have to react challenges. very quickly. Let me ask you a question. How was the pandemic for you personally? Well, I'm, well, if you have to think about the other aspect of that and just on a very personal level, I mentioned earlier that I travel in my role 60, yeah. 65% of the time, meaning I'm out of the country. Uh, I know uh, that feeling. <laughs> you know, I've, I've got family and, and, and so I move from not, not being at home in that kind of way to being at home every single day. Yeah. And on a personal level, that was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so to be around my kids, my wife, and, and, and actually just see what happens even in my home environment on a, on when you're there during the day, it was, it was just, obviously it was a bit different with the pandemic, but, but just generally. So in a way, it was brilliant. And the time I, I will I will always treasure, actually, the time that I was able to spend with my kids just doing nonsense that ordinarily I wouldn't be able to do. Mm. Um, I watched every, bizarrely, I'd not watched a Marvel movie <laughs> until the pandemic. You've seen and them all now, I've right? seen all of them. <laughs> I'd not watched any, se any season of Grey's Anatomy which I think had been running for like 17 years. I was going to say. And I watched all of them. Wow. So you Brilliant. binged it. Absolutely. Everyone had a very, very personal, I think, experience during the pandemic. I, I always say that. As we get towards the end of this conversation, and I think we're going to have to have you back at some point. There's a lot to talk about. <laughs> you know that I'm passionate about the human being as well as the human doing, human-centered leadership. That's always been a big focus for me. I think predominantly because of maybe the work that I've done and I've seen the best of human behavior but unfortunately I've also seen the worst when I was within law enforcement and we spoke a bit about humans at center yep. tell me a little bit about that and, and and what that means to you as a leader well I think philosophically it's it's absolutely aligned to what you've just said there, that that you know I'm in the consulting business where which if you distill it in very simple terms we're professional change management people so yep. we help organizations move from whatever position that they're in today to a different state. That could be a new organization structure. It could be a new set of products and services. It could be new technology they're implementing, whatever it may be. Yep. We're helping them move from where they are today to that different place. The single most important factor as to determining their success or otherwise is always the people. Always, always. Be it the leaders, the vision that they set, how yeah. clear and articulate they are in terms of uh, empowering their organization as to what are we trying to achieve here and why? What's in it for you? How will you benefit, et cetera, et cetera? And then ultimately the people that need to make that happen, both the managers, all of the middle management who kind of craft and make those things happen, but then also the workers that have to adopt, adapt, change. And if you don't, create the conditions to make that happen things will not work so it doesn't matter how great the technology is you know we're in an era of technology oh, it doesn't oh, matter great how debate <laughs> it doesn't matter how great ai is going to be and yeah. how it's going to change the world and you know we'll, we'll forget humans now because ai is going to do everything ultimately if people don't embrace it people don't adopt it if they don't i just talked earlier about the teams thing and how quickly that flipped you have to create the conditions that will mean that people run to making something happen. And d taking a human-centric approach, there's a number of interventions we could talk about that are critical to that journey, I think is, is key for an individual. So your role, Adam, in terms of making that happen, but it's also key collectively that you have individuals then that unite collectively as a team, as an organization to make that work. You said earlier, the, obviously there's a sense of notoriety when you're a senior leader in a large organization there's lots of people who know you yes. but you don't know them so there's a there's a gaggle of them potentially in the lift and your name comes up how do you hope that they speak about you as a leader you mean with me outside of the lift yeah <laughs> what do you hope that they that they they see and they say about errol gardner who is a leader 
of an organization where you cannot know everybody what do you hope is that message uh, that's, a, that's a really good question i i would hope that they would see that i have a strong vision of what the future is for our organization yeah. and how we can be successful i would like to think that they see me as an inclusive leader that has um that listens as much as i speak that um absorbs other people's ideas as much as yes. championing my own and i would hope that they would see that i give them a platform to be themselves to be successful and to make a difference i love that i got a final question it's a question i haven't asked for ages actually i don't know why i stopped asking this question but and this might be slightly unfair errol is what's the best piece of leadership advice that you've ever given or received and there's going to be lots of it but i'm interested at in what is front of mind for you look i think um I always find these types of questions really difficult because it, it's always about context. Of course. It's always about which point at which moment. I think for me, if I kind of reflect on my career, because yep. it's always difficult to distill it into one, I think you have to be ready to take risks. So be jump out of your comfort zone. We haven't had a chance to talk about that today, but in many ways, well, going to Jamaica, out of my comfort yeah. zone, yeah, my, my going to consulting, completely out of my comfort zone. When I came back to London, I, I moved into um, leading technology aspects of projects. So I started running development teams, people that were writing code. Somebody asked me, would you, would you manage it? I said, I have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> I can lead a team, but I have no idea. What. Lead the experts. Take risks and, and, and trust yourselves that you can do that. But I think then the flip side of that is be curious and be ultimately clear about learning that, you know, you leave school and I would say in all honesty, as you go into the work environment, you know nothing. Yeah. And what you need to do in the work environment is embrace continuous learning. I hope you found this a useful, curious conversation, Errol, because I always love the fact we never really know where it's going to go because actually you lead and I'll follow and in some ways we'll just have, uh, as I hear intrigue, we'll just start to unpeel it. But I just want to say a massive thank you for taking the time to come on into the Leadership Enigma. I hope this has been fun for you. It has. I really appreciate it and thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Thanks very much indeed. Join us again next week for more curiosity and insight with the Leadership Enigma. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Get in touch with me on LinkedIn or visit us at www.leadersenigma.com. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe on all your major podcast platforms and on our dedicated YouTube channel. Thanks again for joining the community.